Hello, I'm Scott Derringer, and I'm the Training Manager at Aviation Performance Solutions. This presentation is a narrative of my article that was published in the March-April 2015 issue of Sky's Magazine entitled Manual Input, the focus of which is this question. Does upset prevention and recovery training really enhance manual handling skills in professional pilots? And why upset prevention and recovery training is a critical facet in building a more able, skilled, and tested community of pilots worldwide? The article, as well as an expanded paper uh, on the same subject, are available at APSTraining.com slash skies. Here's an overview of the uh, discussion that we'll have here today. First and foremost, we'll define what manual flying skills are. We'll then talk about a few case studies of recent mishaps due to poor manual flying skills that were cited as, uh, as a causal factor. We'll talk through some deficiencies that may be present in, in current traditional flight training worldwide. And lastly, we'll describe some facets of a proper upset prevention and recovery training program and how they affect manual flying skill development. So first and foremost, let's talk about manual flying. Manual flying is generally thought of as those flying abilities a pilot uses to fly the aircraft only by reference to the raw data presented in the forms of airspeed, altitude, attitude, vertical speed, and so on, through direct manipulation of the controls without the aid of automation. This automation includes, but isn't necessarily limited to autopilot systems, auto throttles, and the variety of flight management systems currently equipped in many modern day aircraft. These skills include complex problem solving in a crew environment, with time as a critical factor. Basic navigation equipment usage and manual trim adjustments can be considered manual flying as well, depending on the sophistication of the equipment. Taking this a step further though, especially as it relates to modern aviation, a pilot's flying technique may combine the above mentioned manual flying skills with combinations of automatic speed and direction control and guidance. These combined inputs usually occur through individual pilot habit patterns or preferences. Procedural requirements, maybe some operational standards or, or possibly when automated systems fail. The latter of these instances, the failure of automation, is a circumstance that is rare but is cited as a contributing factor in several recent and deadly crashes. The failure of automation, or perhaps even worse, the degraded modes of operation that may result make the pilot's manual flying skills incredibly important and are often the decisive factor between a survival recovery, survivable recovery and one that is not. So looking at some case studies here, first we'll talk about China Airlines Flight 140. We'll talk through the Colgan Air Flight 3407 and lastly uh, the Air France Flight 447 accident. So looking at the China Airlines Flight 140 crash, it was an Airbus A300-600R that crashed on an approach to runway 34 at Nagoya Airport, Japan on April 26, 1994. The co-pilot, after several inappropriate activations of the go-around mode on approach and several subsequent cautions from the captain, inadvertently selected the takeoff go-around mode on approach. The aircraft pitched up and immediately stalled, which led to a loss of control in flight uh, and tail first impact with the ground. The crew failed to recognize the stall or appropriately apply manual handling skills on a manual approach. The crash killed 264 people and injured seven more. Colgan Air Flight 3407 is a mishap that is much more recent. On February 12, 2009, a DHC-8-400, or a-8 for short, operated by Colgan Airlines on a code share uh, with Continental Airlines, crashed into a residential area while on an ILS approach to B Buffalo Niagara International Airport at night uh, in VMC. The aircraft entered a stalled condition due to improper power settings and airspeed control, and the crew reacted by pulling on the control column, which increased the angle of attack further and worsened the stall condition. Following this inappropriate reaction, the crew lost control of the aircraft, which resulted in a fatal crash that killed all 50 aboard and one person on the ground. And lastly, and much more publicized worldwide, is the crash of Air France 447, which was an Airbus A330-200 that departed Rio de Janeiro, Brazil on June 1, 2009 and crashed into the Atlantic Ocean en route to Paris, France. 
After a two-year-long multinational effort to find the crashed aircraft at the bottom of the ocean, the wreckage was finally recovered. It was determined that a loss of airspeed sensing resulted in the aircraft's fly-by-wire system degrading to a mode of control uh, that had fewer protections than the crew was used to having. At an altitude of 35,000 feet, the aircraft stalled. The crew responded with a pull on the control stick and maintained the pull, holding the aircraft in a stalled condition for over four minutes until impact with the water. The improper crew manual flying response to this un unexpected stall condition resulted in the crash that killed all 228 aboard. So looking at the effects of these mishaps on the industry, poor manual handling skills precipitated all these cases, and the effects on the aviation industry worldwide as a whole were resounding. These are all sobering examples of sophisticated aircraft ending up destroyed with massive loss of life in large part due to the lack of manual handling skills uh, of crew members that were faced with the degradation of their normal automatic modes of operation. Although there is seldom just a single causal factor of any accident, the lost control that made these accidents so horrific would most likely never have occurred had the pilots had been better trained uh, to take over manually. So it becomes painfully clear that manual handling, as described earlier, is a critical dimension of the professional pilot skill sets. The public outcry over the discovery that Air France 447 went down as a result of a lost control in flight exacerbated by an inappropriate crew response accelerated a long overdue response from the industry set in motion by the Colgan accident. Andy Pastor of the Wall Street Journal wrote, The latest revelations, according to safety experts and others familiar with them, are likely to add to pressure with re to revamp training practices to help both new and experienced pilots cope with high-altitude stalls, upsets, and faulty airspeed sensors. The accident spawned a broad reappraisal of pilot training, examination of the undue reliance on automation, and concluded that the incident could have been avoided had the pilots received more training in manual flying and stall recognition. New air transport pilot certification rules resulted in the United States specifically, and the, and the undue reliance on automation many air crews have uh, was scrutinized heavily. So now let's talk about the competencies uh, that the International Airline Transport Association, or IATA, has recognized. They've put forth eight core competencies that are required by today's airline pilot, ranging from communications to leadership. No one of these competencies is dramatically as affected by an unanticipated upset event as the competency of aircraft flight management by manual control. Some of the ways that these manual handling skills require, skill requirements are influenced by an aircraft upset may be completely counterintuitive, specifically when it surprises the pilot. Psychophysiological factors uh, begin to rear their heads. Instinctual reactions take over, many of which are quite dangerous. Upset prevention and recovery training is flight training that focuses on addressing uh, the academic knowledge and practical skills necessary to properly deal with an upset event, particularly, particularly those ones uh, that may elicit an instinctual response that is dangerous. It helps the pilot to see which uh, one of these behaviors is proper, which one of these uh, cues that they're seeing, either uh, visually uh, or vestibularly or whatever, should be paid attention to and which ones uh, should not. Looking further at this core competency of manual handling uh, without the autopilot engaged, there are several different facets that can be uh, uh, Dissected, really. Let's look at this first one here. Flight control inputs in, in particular. Uh, for normal airline operations, smooth, progressive, and small deflections that eventually reach, uh, you, you know, an eventual goal are required. However, should an upset occur, those change drastically. You might need rapid, possibly assertive, maybe even up to full deflection uh, flight control inputs to affect a survivable recovery, which you can see is totally different than what uh, you know, a normal flight profile would, uh, would include. Upset prevention and recovery training demonstrates the full range of flight control inputs and effects, shows the differences and the benefits from authoritative flight control inputs when used properly. You can see this same 
this same story is spoken throughout all of these different manual flight path management uh, pieces here. When normal airline operations are generally completely different, sometimes even opposite than some of the skills that are required in an upset event. For instance, here, looking at the last one, control feedback, feel, and responsiveness. Under normal airline operations, relatively narrow range of control inputs uh, are provided when flying manually with the autopilot disengaged. However, should an upset occur, particularly those that might surprise the crew, a broad range of flight control responses uh, may be encountered in dynamic maneuvering situations. The gamut expands is the whole point here. Exposure and training in the full range of control inputs which may be required to prevent or recover from unexpected upset encounters is what proper upset prevention and recovery training can give uh, to these crews. So taking this a step further here, there may be significant traditional flight training uh, deficiencies uh, worldwide, really. All too often during traditional flight training, stalls and upsets are treated as scripted events where the setup and approach to the maneuver demands more focus than the recovery itself. A pilot untrained on upset prevention and recovery possesses manual handling skills acquired from their training. This training, in most cases, is designed to satisfy the respective National Aviation Authority testing standards in the country of training for certification of pilot licenses. Great emphasis is placed on procedures used to prepare and configure for a very limited set of stalls and unusual attitudes. Rich Stoll, for instance, a multiple-time master CFI aerobatic and published flight training author states, treated as an independent maneuver unto itself, the whole ordeal of a stall is often enveloped in unnecessary melodrama as well. The actual lessons learned, however, are fear and a false association between the stall and slow airspeed. As a result, all too often a poor and dangerous strategy may develop that seems quite plausible. Fly faster to provide for a larger margin against these stalls that are misunderstood and are perceived as frightening. This shows an inherent weakness in upset prevention and recovery training deficient pilots, or more succinctly stated, a gap of knowledge on a critical portion of an aircraft's performance, the stall, which is the leading cause of loss of control in flight. Upset prevention and recovery training seeks to close that gap to fill in those missing pieces of, learning ma of learned manual handling ability through uh, various means. The first step in those means is classroom-based instruction. It is an expansion of what can be termed book knowledge by examination and review of those aerodynamic factors that apply to all fixed-wing airplanes. Classic stall recognition techniques are covered. Exploration of applicable performance charts relating to load factor, bank angles, velocity, and other aerodynamic subjects is conducted. And case studies highlighting proper and improper use of recovery procedures are detailed. This portion of upset prevention and recovery training is absolutely vital and sets a solid foundation for understanding why prevention and recovery steps are designed the way they are, how a proper strategy can aid the pilot to make the recovery or even prevention measures much more survivable and effective. Armed with this knowledge, the Upset Prevention Recovery Training Pilot in Training is equipped to execute on-aircraft training using the techniques and strategies covered in the classroom. It provides a foundation upon which other training will occur, not only on aircraft, but full flight simulator training as well if the, uh, if, if the pilot in training decides to, uh, to take it that step further. The on-aircraft flight training is the next step. Flight training is an in an appropriate aircraft is absolutely the next step. An aerobatic capable aircraft is recommended both uh, by the FAA and the International Civil Aviation Organization, uh, among other uh, national aviation authorities. They recommend conducting on aircraft upset prevention and recovery training in an aerobatic category airplane to expose pilots to maneuvers such as uncoordinated stalls and spiral dives which would, in a normal or transport category aircraft, put the crew at high risk to enter spins or other loss control in flight events that could be unrecoverable due to decreased safety margin, margins in those aircraft types. Aerobatic aircraft have a much higher safety margin and ability to conduct all attitude and all envelope training than other aircraft types, specifically transport category airplanes. This point begs the question, however, 
Can jet pilots really learn effective upset prevention and recovery training in a single engine piston airplane? Well, the answer isn't the question itself. A jet is an airplane, subject to the same general aerodynamic laws as a single engine piston aircraft. Granted, each has differences in pitch moments with power changes, keel effect, turning tendencies, yaw damper considerations, among many, many other things. But these differences make up an estimated 5% uh, disparity or so between aircraft types. With that said, the training industry agrees that type-specific considerations are critical to effective upset prevention recovery training skill development and must be comprehensively addressed during type rating and recurrent training. Overall, the bottom line is an airplane is an airplane. And virtually all pilots begin their careers, all fixed-wing pilots, I should say, begin their careers in the same kind, a single-engine piston airplane. Upset training is intended to be transferable. It should follow a pilot through his or her career, and thus the tenets taught during early training should be relatable to any fixed-wing aircraft. That said, an aerobatic aircraft is clearly more maneuverable than other aircraft types has higher uh, load factor limits, higher G-force uh, onset rates, smaller turn radii, faster roll rates, and so on. However, most pilots of less maneuverable or more limited categories never truly see their aircraft, or any other for that matter, at the limits of or beyond what they consider normal flight parameters. The closest most get to these parameters is the approach to stall indications during their once-a-year recurrent simulator sessions. They would never dream of using maximum aileron deflection or pushing on the control column or stick before or while rolling out of an upset. Accomplishing these techniques and many more techniques exclusive to upset prevention recovery training expand the pilot's awareness, their learning horizons, aerodynamic understanding, practical experience, and edge-of-the-envelope experience. The goal of the full flight simulator portion of upset training is to establish a solid and workable knowledge of basic upset prevention uh, strategy application and fundamental knowledge before full flight simulator training is accomplished. This final stage is intended to place the pilot in a wide variety of situations where upset prevention recovery techniques are very applicable. Once the basics of upset prevention recovery training and general strategies are learned, it's equally vital to allow the pilot in training to experience these strategies in a full flight simulator that more closely resembles their normal flying environment. This allows them to realize that upset prevention recovery training works in any airplane and helps them to correlate the aerodynamic lessons they've learned through upset prevention recovery training. Helps them to realize that these uh, strategies apply to their own aircraft or one of a similar type or category. Furthermore, crew resource management is tested and upset prevention recovery training is applied in this kind of environment because manual flying doesn't always apply to only the pilot flying, but also his or her crew members as well. So in closing, manual flying can be described as an intrinsic uh, flying ability, assumed at least by the flying public to be part of the skill sets, uh, skill sets of all commercial pilots. If present, even innate skills can be approved can be improved, polished, and expanded upon. If these skills are not present, they can be learned. Manual flying skills include everything from basic instrument reference and simple flight control inputs to complex problem solving in a crew environment. Often when time is of the essence, uh, upset prevention and recovery training is aimed at improving and building upon these basic skills and teaching new ones for the unexpected. In a perfect world, the use of upset prevention and recovery training would never be required, but this is most definitely not a perfect world, and the unexpected happens every day. So, does upset prevention and recovery training really enhance manual handling and skills in professional pilots? Absolutely, and without question, it does. In fact, Improving manual handling is a core goal of upset prevention and recovery training. Chance favors a prepared mind, Louis Pasteur once said. And upset prevention and recovery training is a critical facet in that preparation for every pilot. These are the references used uh, to compile this data and, and to uh, write this article in question here. 
APS specializes on the delivery of upset prevention and recovery training for pilots uh, of all skill levels to dramatically reduce the loss control and flight threat. We offer online, on aircraft, advanced simulator, train the trainer, and integrated upset training solutions. Please visit us at APSTraining.com. Thank you for your time today.